Well, thank you everyone for uh, attending, coming to the uh, RSS Brown Bag Speaker Series. And this week we have our very own John Lambert. Uh, John joined ISAS uh, almost two years ago. He holds our position of our archaeological spatial analyst. Uh, John specializes in late Pleistocene, early Holocene archaeology of the Western Great Lakes and Upper Mississippi Valley, with emphasis on hunter-gatherer mobility, site structure, and stone tool technologies. His technical specialties include geographic information systems and spatial analysis, lithic analysis, and human behavioral ecology. Uh, we lured John from California, as I said, almost two years ago. He uh, holds his master's degree from the University of California, Davis, where he is also currently a PhD candidate. Um, when John joined us, one of his initial tasks was to begin work on creating a new archaeological model for the state of Illinois. <laughs> With that, he's going to talk to us about the Illinois Archaeological Predictive Model. All right, cool. Thanks, Mike. Uh, it wasn't that hard to get lured out of California. I mean, the whole state was on fire when I left. So <laughs> it's hot, but it's not as hot here. Uh, okay, so I know some of you guys have seen a little bit about uh, the new predictive model over the course of like a few staff meetings and kind of here and there different announcements about it. Uh, but I wanted to take today to you know, take a spin through it, show you guys, you know, what it predicts, you know, how it was built, uh, and then sort of our plans going forward on how to roll it out. Okay, so what is it? Uh, the Illinois Archaeological Predictive Model, uh, essentially when you really get down to it, it is trying to predict what's the probability of running into an archaeological site at any given location. Uh, so you guys will see that figure a lot. I mean, kind of spoiler alert, those are the results, so you'll see that come up. <laughs> uh, so red is high probability, blue is low probability, uh, green is kind of medium. Uh, so it's based on over 53,000 recorded prehistoric site locations uh, that were amassed over 100 plus years of survey in the state. A uh, bunch of environmental and geophysical variables, uh, but we'll kind of go through all of what that is. Uh, so first I just want to talk a little bit about, you know, what is predictive modeling? Why do I think it's a good approach to, like, address this sort of problem? Uh, and then talk about our model specifically uh, and how it was put together. So, I mean, most of you guys in the room are archaeologists. I mean, it's no big surprise that uh, archaeological sites are being impacted all the time. Uh, they're a non-renewable resource, which is, you know, nobody's out there making thousand-year-old, ten-thousand-year-old sites anymore. Uh, you know, I mean, and this is an old, obviously old photos from Powell Mound being steam shoveled away. You didn't need a predictive model to find that mound. Everybody knew where it was. Uh, but this problem is still going on, right? So. You know, we do have a lot of modern situations where we have ideas about where we're going to run into archaeology. It's not a big surprise that we hit lots of archaeology east of St. Louis. Uh, but that's not the case everywhere. And time and funding for survey excavation is limited. We have a certain amount of resources that we can send out into the field. Uh, and from the perspective of a landowner or a developer, they really don't have much information going into a project about where should they expect to run into archaeology. You, know, you think about uh, like FEMA flood maps. So a landowner before they buy a house can say, hey, what's my risk of being flooded in the next 10, 20, 100 years? There's really no equivalent of that for archaeology. Uh, so this is all occurring in a context where you know, archaeologists and developers need to comply with federal and state law about historic preservation, uh, and do their best to avoid impacts to the archaeological record. Uh, so I think kind of in that framework, predictive modeling, you know, where should we expect to run into sites is a really good approach. Uh, it's pretty cost effective, you know, especially when you think about the fact that it's impossible to do a 100% survey of any area. You know, it doesn't matter if it's 
a valley or you know let alone something like the whole state of Illinois so this is a really good approach to try and get you know more information about places that haven't been surveyed based on places that have so kind of think of it that way uh, it also helps us move archaeology earlier in the planning process so developers engineers landowners archaeologists uh, we have more information that we can use to help plan projects in a way that avoid impacting the archaeological record in the first place. So what is a predictive model? Uh, kind of at the most basic level, you take some you know, independent variables, so things like you know, elevation, slope, native vegetation. Uh, you take recorded site locations and non-site locations, and you feed that into some statistical model, and you get predictions about where we should we expect to find stuff. So that's the basic idea. And it's not exactly a new thing that archaeologists have tried to do. Uh, you know, at least since the 30s, you know, in Julian Stewart, people have been talking about the fact that where people choose to live uh, you know, and other aspects of economic and subsistence behavior have something to do with the environment. So that's not exactly a new idea. Uh, it wasn't until, say, the 60s through the 80s that the sort of predictive modeling that we're used to seeing now really took off. Uh, you had increased availability of new computing technology, you know, better statistics, uh, Kind of an increased awareness that how we sample archaeological data really matter. Uh, and, you know, also being critical about where do our data come from? You know, what sorts of theory or uh, data generating processes affect what we see? Uh, but there's been a lot of disagreement within archaeology and actually a lot of disciplines about whether predictive modeling is even something that's worthwhile. Uh, I don't feel that's actually a fair question. You know, what is this for? Is it a useful approach? Uh, I would argue yes, <laughs> or I wouldn't be here. <laughs> but, uh, you know, some of that criticism is coming out of the fact that a lot of these early models actually weren't very successful. Uh, they, you know, had good ideas, they were trying out new statistical techniques, but they weren't very good at prediction. And when you actually tested them, they kind of fell apart. Uh, and there's also this kind of conflict with what are our models for? Are we trying to explain human behavior? You know, why do people do what they do? Or are we just trying to predict where should we expect to find something like sites or any other kind of phenomenon? So I think that last question is actually kind of important. Uh, so you have this one school of predictive modeling that says models should be for explaining behavior. So we you know, have some theory about human behavior, uh, whether it's something like human behavioral ecology or anything else. Uh, you know, that leads us to a hypothesis. We pick our data. We pick our questions. Uh, you know, if it's something like HBE, you know, you're going to assume that uh, human behavior is designed to optimize some currency, whether that's you know, calories, reproductive success, Minimizing risk, uh, minimizing time, it could be any of those kinds of things. Uh, the phenotypic gambit is just saying we don't necessarily need to know how people arrive at that optimal decision, but we think they're going to. Uh, and so that could be maybe a model of, you know, how do things like the distribution of resources and the information people have about them structure settlement and where people live. Uh, so that's this old, this Dyson, Hudson, and Smith model. I wish the, the pointer doesn't do anything on that screen. We need one of those like long sticks for these sorts of things. Those need to come back into vogue with, uh, with screens. Uh, and really we're just trying to test in these sorts of explanatory models, does the model we made explain the behavior we see? So statistics is more used for testing. Does the model apply to this behavior that we see in the archaeological record, the anthropological literature, or whatever. So that's really different from this other approach that is more just about where should we expect to find things. You know, it's not based on you know, a certain evolutionary theory or set of ideas. 
Uh, these are typically really empirical models. We take, as I said, the kinds of archaeological and environmental data that we have available, and we try and see is there a correlation between certain landscape features and where we find things. Uh, you know, these kinds of models usually have a really strong focus on practical applications, so stuff like salvage archaeology, uh, CRM, uh, and they really prioritize you know, predictive accuracy over explanation. Uh, and statistics are usually central to the design of these models. Uh, so Minnesota is the first state, and I'll talk a little bit more about this, that had a statewide predictive model. Uh, I think it was released in 1998. So it's been around a long time. Uh, other states have kind of followed suit, but there's a number of these models out there now. Okay, so this is kind of where I come down. Uh, we know all models are wrong, but they're useful. So I think that's, this is actually a really worthwhile venture. Uh, we know we can never make a true model. Even if we did, we probably wouldn't know that it was the true model. Uh, so you worry about things that you can control in your data. You select good data. You test the things you can test. And models are actually useful because they're simplified cartoons of reality. You know, things get too simple and they don't really help us understand things very well. Uh, so I definitely fall, at least for this kind of approach, much more on the practical side of things. Uh, I'm actually a big fan of HPE, as you know, as Mike said in the intro, but uh, at least as far as predicting things, I think that like purely empirical approach is kind of the way to go. So people have actually kind of tried this stuff in Illinois before. This isn't the first time that we've done this. Uh, so there was a volume that came out in uh, 1981. It's an organized, edited volume uh, that split the state up into, I think, 10 regions and tried to make predictive models about where should we find sites in these places. Uh, it's a thoroughly depressing read. <laughs> so you get really rosy sentiments at the end of all the chapters that are kind of like this. You know, we insist our generalizations should be assigned limited predictive significance. Uh, this is a dubious effort and failed to produce any meaningful results. <laughs> uh, lots of the chapters had good ideas and proposed some new statistical tests. Uh, I mean, you got to keep in mind this is almost 40 years ago, so they didn't have all the data that we have available. Uh, a lot of these techniques were really new. Uh, I, there's a review chapter at the end, I think. I think maybe Donna Roper wrote it, and she just eviscerates the chapters in the book. So, uh, But it did kind of set the stage for people thinking about predictive modeling in the state. So it's actually a really important volume. Uh, and then we had this model that came out in 1994 uh, that actually the state still uses. It's written into state law, uh, which is basically just a buffer to rivers. So we should expect to find more sites closer to rivers, you know, even a little bit closer in to things like smaller headwaters, and then also in areas with kind of specific soil types. So who else has done these models? We're not the only one. Uh, there are a handful of other states besides Minnesota that have statistical models that predict site locations. Uh, Iowa, I think, was the next one to finish a model. Uh, Washington and Pennsylvania both have finished theirs within the last couple of years. Uh, North Carolina has a model that's done for, I think, like seven or eight pilot counties. Uh, and then you have a handful of other places like Texas and Michigan that are primarily basing their predictions on geoarchaeological data. So where should we expect buried sites? Uh, and then you have places like Vermont where it's essentially like a subjective score sheet. You know, the, within this distance of water, uh, is it on this type of landform? Uh, now you can kind of see IAPM. I don't really love those like snazzy acronyms. <laughs> like landmass and palms are really cheesy, but so we can rename maybe going forward. Okay, so this is kind of something you guys already saw, but just a little bit more detail. Uh, keep in mind this is only a model of prehistoric site location. So we chose not to include or try to model the location of historic sites. They're just really different in the kinds of things that are controlling historic site locations. So think about 
proximity to rail networks or proximity to existing towns or roads or highways, uh, canals, stuff like that. So really different set of things that were probably important for people in the last couple hundred years than were over the past 13,000. Uh, so like I said, 53,000 plus sites, a bunch of environmental data, and then also the models are being run in individual watersheds. So we've got 46 of these, you know, this kind of size watershed in the state, uh, and it's a multi-level Bayesian logistic regression. <laughs> so I'll talk about what that means, so don't worry about that too much right now. Okay, so here are the data. Uh, so we've got 53,000 and change uh, recorded prehistoric sites in the state up to February of 2017. So that was the training data for the model. I froze everything after that date and used that for testing. Uh, and then also an equal number of random non-site locations. So that question of, so the basic data you feed in your model, you've got to have places with sites and places without them. So the model has to be able to compare what are different at places that have sites from places that don't. You know, how, what kind of landscape features distinguish them? Uh, your choice of how to get those non-site locations is actually really tricky. So a lot of people use places that have been surveyed that didn't find sites. Uh, but, I mean, you guys have all surveyed before. You know that if you go out one day and it's a different lighting condition or has rained recently or, you know, the person next to you in line can actually know what they're looking at, you're more likely to find things. So just because a place was surveyed and they didn't find a site doesn't mean there isn't a site there. So that can be kind of tricky. Uh, so in practice, most people use these kind of like randomly sampled non-site locations. So uh, you know, obviously sites aren't distributed randomly across the state. You have a few areas like the collar counties around Chicago or the East St. Louis area. So that map on the right is a density map of sites uh, where there's lots of sites documented. You have other places in the state that don't have very many sites documented. Uh, so we need a model that can deal with that kind of like survey and documentation bias. So here's just kind of a different way to look at site distribution. Uh, it's called a LISA map. So essentially what it shows are, think hot spots and cold spots. Areas that have a statistically high count of sites next to other areas that have a high count. So those are the bright red. Uh, areas that have low next to low, so low counts next to other areas next to low, that's the blue. Uh, and then you get other areas that are more like a checkerboard. There's not very much of that in. Uh, in Illinois, but the light blue are low next to high and then high next to low. So you compare that to where surveys have been done, you know, it matches up pretty well. I mean, not surprisingly, places that have a lot of survey, have a lot of sites. Uh, it's not a one-to-one -one correlation, but it's pretty close. So that's our test data. Uh, so as far as independent variables go, uh, we have, you know, I kind of broke them down into a few main groups. So Distance to good stuff, that's sort of one group. So, uh, and it's actually cost distance, so it takes into account slope and topography, how difficult is it to get to something, not just how far is it. Uh, so things like the division between prairies and forests, that's a nice little, you know, kind of ecotone where you get more resources, it's a nice place to live. Uh, major rivers, the Lake Michigan coast, medium streams, headwaters. Uh, then there's a set of variables that have to do with topography. Uh, things like elevation there in the middle, so green is low and red and white are high. Uh, or local relief on the right, so that's a measure of how rugged an area is. If it has more relief, there's more difference between the lowest and highest point in kind of a, think about a half kilometer area, something like that. Uh, slope, you know, how variable slope is in an area. Uh, aspect, which turned out not to be that important. Uh, aspect was kind of a funny one where in a lot of the elevation data, there are areas that are classified as totally flat. A lot of those areas turn out to actually be water. So 
aspects. You'll, you'll see in some of the figures that like north, south, east, and west all have positive associations, which is probably just a proxy for that place is not in the middle of the lake. <laughs> uh, which is actually kind of useful to know, so I left it in there. Uh, and then a bunch of data that are also derived from soil. Uh, things like local soil diversity, kind of the idea being it's a proxy for like local environmental variation. Uh, native vegetation, which is also drawn from soil data. Uh, we have native vegetation maps for Illinois that are based on the old GLO surveys from the 1800s, but they're a little dicey. <laughs> a lot of those surveyors may never have actually walked into the middle of a section. They just say, ah, there's trees over there somewhere. Or things are mismapped. There's all sorts of problems. So I didn't end up using that. Uh, also drainage class. So is a place well drained? Is it poorly drained? Uh, and then a few things, you know, like I said, if you just want to make a practical model, not every variable has to actually correspond to like how people picked sites in the past. So I added some things like erosion and pH that probably have more to do with site preservation than actual site selection in the past. pH might have something to do with site selection if you're you know, an agriculturalist, but erosion is more like, should we expect sites to be preserved there now? Okay, so all the data were processed in GIS. Uh, they all get fed into statistical software uh, called R. Uh, don't worry about too much in there, but basically what happens is you feed in table data, you do statistics magic in R, it comes out the other side as variable coefficients. So what do we expect the effect of something like distance to water to be? Uh, and then you put that back in GIS and apply it to all the data that we have for the state. So we have great data for Illinois, that's actually one of the strengths uh, of our, you know, kind of like statewide data set. And then you make predictions, you know, based on the value of slope, the value of elevation, the distance to water at a certain location, should we expect to find a site there or not? So that's kind of the basic idea. <clears throat> okay, so now I just want to spend a couple minutes talking about what exactly is multi-level Bayesian regression. So it's not as scary as it sounds, I promise. Uh, so this is like soapbox warning. This is my one soapbox slide. So I think Bayesian statistics are a really good alternative to the kind of classical statistical tests we're all used to. Things like t-tests or chi-squared. Uh, statistical tests are all really inflexible and they break really unpredictably in spectacular ways if you apply them to situations where they weren't designed for. Uh, you, know, you get these sort of terrible, awful flow charts that people have to consult where, okay, are my data normally distributed? Are the variances equal in my group? So I don't know, maybe then I come down here and I do this test, or maybe I do a one-way ANOVA, and I put some Bonferroni frosting on it at the end, and yes, you know, so it's it's very intimidating. You know, it's easy to pick the wrong tests. They don't always do what you think they're going to do, uh, and I also think that that idea that we should be like proposing these kind of dummy straw men null hypotheses and disproving them isn't very good science. Uh, hypotheses aren't models, so you have an idea about human behavior or where we should expect to find things, for example, uh, which can actually correspond to a bunch of different statistical models. So it's not even very clear if you get a null result from one model, what does that mean for your hypothesis? You didn't disprove it or prove it, really. Uh, you know, measurement also matters. So even if you come up with a significant result, somebody can always argue with your data. They can say, oh, well, that person digs their sites with egg beaters and hand grenades. You know, you can't trust anything that they say. Uh, or, you know, with genetics, somebody can say, well, I think there's contamination in your data, or you didn't take account of population structure, or something like that. Uh, and also, just because you don't get a significant result doesn't mean there's no effect of the thing you're trying to look at. Uh, so, and vice versa, everybody knows that you can just increase your sample size and get a significant result if you want. So, 
There's really nothing sacred about that P equals 0.05 threshold of significance testing. Uh, that level or that threshold was actually developed by uh, the statistician William Gossett who was working at Guinness. So that 0.05 level, he developed the student's t-test as a way to take like small batch experimental beer brewing data and make a decision about like, are we gonna get a good batch of beer? And I think a 5% cutoff is an acceptable risk for having to throw out a batch of beer if we're wrong. So it was based on a really specific like cost benefit decision from a really specific problem. Uh, so, you know, we're not like tied to that in any way. So Bayesian statistics, I think, are a really good alternative where there are a lot fewer assumptions about what your data look like. They don't have to be normally distributed. You don't have to have equal variance between groups. Uh, you know, in fact, Bayesian statistics give you a way to preserve and quantify uncertainty all the way from measure, you know, measurement all the way through your final results. So it's a much more honest and open approach to showing your results. Uh, and it's based on probability theory, which is good because most of our hypotheses are actually quantitative. They're not, we don't make very many good hypotheses in science that are like all swans are white. Because that's really easy to disprove, right? You see one black swan and you're done. Pack it up and go home. They're more like 80% of swans are white, which is a lot harder to try and figure out if you got the right answer or not. So, you know, probability theory actually really helps us here because it's basically just a fancy way of counting. So things that have more ways of happening get assigned a higher probability. Okay, soapbox over. <laughs> so what does Bayes' theorem look like? It's actually not too mystical. It's much simpler than a lot of the other methods. All it basically says is the probability of something happening is equal to a probability function times some prior belief we have about the universe, and that can come from another study, it can come from another model, uh, and then divided by another prior. So if we just look at this kind of simple cartoon example of veals, so the probability of seeing, or the probability of a beetle being from this rare species if it's red, that's what we want to figure out. So we saw a red beetle, is it from this rare subspecies? Uh, we know that 98% of rare beetles are red, so that's the likelihood. 5% uh, of the common beetle species is red, and 0.1% of uh, all beetles are from this rare species. So there's only a 1.9% chance that that red beetle we saw is actually from that rare species. So this is a really simple example, but it sort of gives you an idea. So we're using some probability function combined with data we have from past observations or past experience. Uh, you can plug in other stuff like uh, this approach is actually really common in medical uh, fields. So like the probability a test is actually a false positive, say it's something like that. Okay, so what does it look like in terms of archaeology? Can I promise this isn't as bad as it looks? So. The probability of there being a site at any location is, uh, comes from the binomial distribution. So think coin flipping. So that's uh, something that only has two possible outcomes. So a, a coin can come up heads or it can come up tails. You know, on a fair coin, your probability is half. There's a half chance it's going to come up one versus the other. Uh, as far as sites go, any location either has a site or it doesn't. So, okay, that's kind of similar. Uh, but instead, our probability is a function of all those environmental variables that we talked about. So there's some, you know, kind of baseline probability, and then you have an effect from each of your environmental variables. So just to speed things, I'll kind of go past that. Okay, so what is this multi-level business? Uh, there's a bunch of ways that we can treat variation across our sample. Uh, so, so remember, we're modeling things by watershed, right? We have chunks of the state that we want to model things across. Uh, you could just draw a box around the state and make a model for the whole, you know, the whole shebang all at once. Well, that's probably not good. You know, that ignores 
you know, the effect of like topography or different environmental characteristics across the state. You lump everything into one pool. Uh, you could model watersheds totally separately from each other, which in practice, that's what most of our statistical models do. You're giving your model amnesia, essentially, where it sees a location and it's like, ooh, a watershed. You know, where should we expect to find sites here? And then you go to the next place. Ooh, a watershed. Where should we expect to find sites? Ooh, and you just do that over and over and over again. Uh, but, you know, the effect of something like elevation or slope down by the Mississippi River you know, like, still tells us something about the effect of those variables over on the Wabash, for example. So they're not like totally separate kinds of universes. Uh, so we need some way to pool data together uh, in sort of a principled approach. That's what this multi-level modeling does. So you get a mean effect for your whole sample universe, but then you allow things to vary within your clusters. So in our case, clusters are watersheds, but they could be, uh, say, kids in a classroom who are observed over the course of like two months. So a kid could be a cluster, a classroom would be a cluster, and you pool data across those. So what kids, how kids do in one classroom on a test should tell you something about how they might do in another classroom on that same test. So think of it that way. Uh, so there's no free lunch. Uh, these models take a lot longer to run. Uh, they're really sensitive to model structure. Uh, oh, this is a super interesting book. I don't want to spend a lot of time on it right now, but it's about this... Uh, this is essentially what we do to most of our statistical models. This guy, Clive Weering, was a classical composer and uh, uh, conductor. He had a PhD in music, super smart guy, and then he got uh, the herpes simplex virus, the same thing that gives you cold sores, and it ate his hippocampus, and now we can't form n new long-term memories. Uh, anyway, read that book. Super, super interesting. <laughs> but. So we don't want to do that to our models. That's not good. <laughs> OK, so I'm going to just, that's the only part I want you to focus on out of this whole awful, ugly slide. So OK, now instead of just having a mean effect for each variable, we have an average, and then we have a varying effect from each watershed. So we allow watersheds to learn from each other and pool information from the average but then also to deviate depending on what's going on in that local area. So I'll skip over all that. Okay, so what did we do? Uh, so like I said, these models take a long time to run. I would love to pool all the data from the whole state into this multi-level structure, uh, but the sun would go dark before the model's finished. Uh, so I split the state into these blocks. So ran them kind of in chunks of like six to eight watersheds. Uh, so to actually tailor the models, there's a bunch of different like diagnostics and statistical tests that tell you like does a variable actually improve your ability to predict things in that area. You, know, you end up getting these uh, estimates of the effects of different variables. So for example, uh, oh, free my laser doesn't work. So this is the distance to ecotones, so that's negative. So the further away you get away from ecotones, the less likely there is to be a site there. Or, uh, you know, really poorly drained areas, and that, at least in this area, or that's really well-drained areas, have more sites. Okay, so like positive is good, negative is bad as far as finding sites go. You also have to plot the predictions of your model. So like I said, these models are pretty sensitive to structure. If you include variables that aren't very well surveyed things or sampled, things can blow up. So obviously we shouldn't expect this to be one giant mega site. There's not a site everywhere in that area. Or it's not like we would never find a site in that area. So that's also something people don't do a lot in practice. Plot your predictions. You gotta see what it's actually showing you. So the result on the right obviously looks better. Okay, so here's the results. So here's our old 1994 model. I actually did run a model where every watershed was modeled separately. So that's that one in the middle. And then the one on the right is the final version that uses that multi-level approach. Uh, you see the results are kind of broadly similar across all three, which should make us feel good. We're probably
probably mapping something that has like real significance in the real world. It's nice if lots of different methods sort of give you similar results. Uh, but when you start to get down to like specific areas, they vary quite a bit. So uh, the old model basically only has you're in or you're out, you're higher probability or you're not. So the red are areas where that model says we should expect more stuff and we have basically no information about other places. Uh, and then the other two, it's continuous. It's zero to one in every single pixel across the whole state. So it's 90 by 90 meters, which is about two acres. Uh, but these two on the right, you know, they do vary in some areas. So prediction was really tough. And the bear drainage in Western Illinois, it kind of ended up looking like nonsense. Uh, I think that has to do with the Conrad effect. So he documented eight gazillion little lithic scatters on every conceivable surface in that watershed. And so the model just couldn't figure out what was high probability and what wasn't. But when you let it learn from adjacent watersheds, it's like, oh, okay, I kind of see what's going on there. And it was able to better you know, predict. Uh, certain other areas, you know, like the cache drainage down here or the saline, I got too excited about those and the multi-level version kind of smoothed out some of that. So, okay, so for anybody that actually has seen Minnesota's new model, they just came out with it. Uh, they use this method called random forest modeling. I'm not gonna really go into what that is. Uh, it's from machine learning. Uh, I ran them. Um, random forest model for Illinois, and it actually performs worse when you see like how many sites does it predict. Uh, it, if you actually look at the American bottoms, it totally misses that the American bottoms should be high probability, which you can't swing a shovel and not hit a site there. So well, there are certain areas where it doesn't do very well. Okay. So remember, these predictions are made on a pretty small, fine-grained local level, so we can zoom way in. It's still a pretty big area, I and mean, it's a five-kilometer scale, but if we look at the American bottoms, it's not just all, you know, say if you're an archaeologist or a developer or anybody else, you're like, holy crap, we're going to find sites everywhere here. This really sucks. The new model has a lot more local variation, so certain areas are still going to be really high there just because it's a productive archaeological landscape, and other areas aren't so high. Uh, we've got some chunks. I should also say areas that had too much missing data got excluded from the model, so you'll see like around Chicago there are blank holes too. So if we move up kind of, kind of like the Big Bend and the Illinois River, uh, Again, I just want to like kind of point out that this has given us a lot more information about areas that really weren't included or addressed in that older model. So we have a smooth it's zero to one. It covers the whole state. Uh, areas, when you really zoom in, some places that were high probability in the old one aren't in the new one and vice versa. So it actually does give us a pretty different picture when you go down to the local level. Places close to water are still good. Okay, we've known that for a long time. That's not a big surprise, right? So there are a few warts. Uh, wow, those images turned out super pixelated. Uh, but anyway, so, okay, that one on the left there, not too bad, right? You know, we've got some things like highway interchanges and other <coughs> things that, okay, the model smooths those out. It's not really keying on, we don't want a highway interchange to like show higher or lower probability, right? Because it didn't exist a thousand years ago. Well, sometimes they do. So these lower probability areas are actually highway on ramps, which might, I could like kind of justify a scenario where that's true. They've been disturbed, you know, we're less likely to find sites now there. But things like this, where that high probability blob in the middle is actually a quarry in the middle of Cook County. So, okay, that's probably not so good. Uh, <laughs> So there are still some kinks to work out, and this is one reason that the model is always, sub we need to keep testing it, see where it does well and where it doesn't. Uh, it, it seems like you get these local, either high or low spots that are kind of like, they've got some topographic variation in otherwise flat areas, but some of them are modern. So we need to figure out how to get those out of our data. Okay, so when you actually test, so this is the multi-level version, here's the 1994 model. Uh, 
that difference between the probabilities is pretty obvious when you look at a histogram. So it's either in or it's out in the old one. The new one, there's this smooth variation. It can be between zero and one. Uh, and the thing that we actually care about as archaeologists, it predicts more sites. So uh, the new model, so there's a couple of things we care about actually. You could draw a whole box around the state and say high probability. You would, you would predict every single recorded archaeological site in the state, which would be fantastic, mm -hmm. but your model doesn't really tell you very much, right? It's not very specific. So you also want to, you want to predict a lot of sites, but you want your high probability to cover as small of an area as possible and be really, really specific. Uh, so in the new one, just say anything over 50% probability covers about 24% of the state. Uh, and it hits 55% of sites. Uh, the old one, high probability, or just anything that's in this red, is 27%, and it only hits 44% of sites. So, okay, we're a lot better. It's not perfect, but it's an improvement. Uh, which kind of leads us to the next steps. Uh, so we have this model now. What do we do with it? Uh, we've already started to incorporate the predictive model into the planning process at ISAS. Uh, so here's a project corridor that we're, I don't know, maybe we already have surveyed it up in Will County. Uh, I can't say this enough times. I think this is one mistake that Minnesota has kind of made. The model is not a replacement for survey. Uh, it, it gives us more information about where we might expect to find things, but it shouldn't mean that okay, that area is low probability, so we never have to look there. Well, that's not good. Then we're only going to learn, we're only going to find sites in areas that look like places where we've already found sites in the past. So that's not good. We're going to perpetuate our survey bias. Uh, but it can really help us tailor uh, survey methods, you know, maybe prioritize places a little bit. Uh, but more importantly, hey, we need to go look in places that are low and high to keep testing the model and make it better. Uh, so, you know, this is maybe the first time we've actually told people about this too. Uh, we also have put together a web app. So the model is publicly available online. Anybody can go and check it out and look at it. Uh, so that's actually the website right there if you want to pull it up and the QR code takes you to the website. Uh, so you can zoom in on a specific area like Champaign or Springfield. You know, what does the model say in my area? So we kind of really envision this as a state service. So think about it as the archaeological equivalent of a FEMA flood map, like I said before. A landowner can see, if I build here, maybe should I expect to hit things? Should I not? Uh, developers like IDOT can look at it and maybe try and tailor projects to avoid high probability areas. We don't want them to start building highways like this, but hopefully they look at it to some extent. People can print maps and get sorts of views of what the data look like for their area. Uh, so like I said, this is live and we want to offer this as, you know, we're the state archaeological survey, this is a service that we're providing for the Illinois public. Uh, you know, again, there's always going to be a role for archaeological expertise, you know, people who aren't archaeologists have a hard time like looking at these maps and trying to figure out what do they mean, what does this mean for my project. Well, okay, I find sites there, but are they going to be like tiny lithic scatters or are they going to be a mound site with a thousand burials? You know, what does that mean? Uh, so one thing we've kind of talked about is providing these sorts of summary reports that, that I don't expect most people to kind of go into what the methods. So they'll provide like, okay, there's this much low, this much high, and there's kind of a summary score. This area is a 6.8 out of 10 on the like, archaeological impact potential. Uh, so it allows people to plan for project costs. It allows us to kind of push them into areas that might be lower probability. Uh, and then the next thing is that that 1994 model is actually written into state legislation. So the SHPO and other parties actually have to consult that 94 model when they're determining, you know, does an area have to receive survey or does it not? Uh, and it's actually written into the legislation that it has to be based on soil data from the 70s and this specific set of rivers 
you know, so it's really outdated now. You know, we've got a model that does a little bit better, and we want to try and replace that. You know, in archaeological practice across the state, uh, we want it's we're going to have to be careful about how we approach it. We're working with PRI to kind of make this happen, but change has to be part of the process. We don't just want to freeze it at the 2019 model now and then have that sit for 20 years. So hopefully we can parlay this into more funding from PRI, potentially from the state. Uh, and then we're also moving, uh, right now the web app is hosted on a public Esri server. We want to get this in-house and get our own GIS server up and running. So that's something we're working on too. Um, so that's about it, thanks.